Hello everyone, thanks for coming and yeah, so my name is Dimitri Jemirov. I work uh, as the team lead of the Kotlin Tools team in the Munich office of JetBrains. And today I'm going to talk about using Kotlin for developing multi-platform projects. So first of all, just as a little, like, just to begin with, uh, how many of you have never seen any, like, any Kotlin code ever? Okay, so quite some people. Well, the bad news is that I will not actually have uh, time to do a int proper introduction to the language, uh, but in order to follow the talk, you will not need to understand it really well, so I will not be referring to any exotic features. I think this should all be quite clear. So what's Kotlin? So it's a modern programming language. We started work on the project almost exactly seven years ago. We released the first version uh, in February last year, and it has been getting quite a good traction, as you probably know. Uh, Kotlin is statically typed. Uh, the key traits that we usually uh, highlight when we talk about Kotlin is that it's concise, safe, and pragmatic. Means that uh, using uh, Kotlin allows you to write less code. Uh, using Kotlin allows you to get rid or avoid certain classes of errors such as null pointer exceptions. And it's pragmatic, so in the sense that it comes from the industry, not from the academia. We are trying to solve real problems experienced by real people, and we hope that the result is accessible and usable in practice. And also, Kotlin is interoperable. So for example, unlike Elm, which, we, which the previous talk was about, we are not trying to build our own universe where everything lives according to our own rules. Instead, we try to focus uh, into f on fitting as smoothly as possible onto the, all the ecosystems that uh, uh, Kotlin interacts with. So on the Java, it's the JVM. In the browser, it's the JavaScript ecosystem. On native, it's the large set of uh, native libraries. So you do not have to get rid of all, those, all of those uh, tools and all of those investments when you start using Kotlin. You just start s write as much code in Kotlin as you need to and keep the rest uh, in and used all the uh, richness of the ecosystem you are living with. So when we started Kotlin, it was purely a JVM language, but since then we have seen the potential of uh, supporting other platforms in Kotlin and all the opportunities that we have with that. So now Kotlin is a multi-platform language. So JVM is the JVM is the first platform that we started with. I'm not going to, to talk about much about it today because there is lots of material available elsewhere. So I'm going to focus on the other topics, so JavaScript, uh, sharing code between platforms, and Kotlin native. So with the, with the current set of tools, you, can actually, you actually have the ability to build uh, multiple tiers of your application using the same, the same language. So you use Kotlin on the server with the JVM and the Java server frameworks, you use Kotlin on Android with their like, regular Android SDK, and you use Kotlin in the browser with Kotlin.js. So let's start our discussion with Kotlin.js. So when you use, uh, when you compile Kotlin to JavaScript, this process works ba basically as a regular source-to-source -source transpilation, similarly to how TypeScript does that and how many other languages that do that. So the Kotlin compiler takes Kotlin source code, only Kotlin, so it does not able, it, it's not able to digest Java or Java bytecode or anything like that, just Kotlin sources, and it generates JavaScript source code out of them. Now, of course, you want to have access to all the libraries that exist on the, uh, JavaScript, in the JavaScript ecosystem. And you also want to access them in a type-safe way. So in order to let you do that, we have actually built a tool that takes TypeScript definitions. Uh, the type, so TypeScript has a facility for building definitions for external libraries. And there is a huge community maintained repository of such definitions called Definitely Typed. And we have built a tool that takes those definitions and uh, produces Kotlin declarations out of them, and you can link those declarations into your program so that you can access those libraries. And finally, once you have the JavaScript, you can use like any of the traditional JavaScript tools for making use of that code. For example, you can use Webpack to package uh, the Kotlin-generated code along with uh, its dependencies into a single JavaScript bundle file. Or you can use any other tool that you prefer to use, so like Kotlin is unopinionated in this regard. So you can use whatever tool, whatever tool chain that you want to use. 
So what do these external declarations look like? So, be, uh, <coughs> so basically, uh, if you want to access an external API from uh, Kotlin.js, you write something like this. So this is a very simple definition of a class, uh, like the window class uh, that has a location property and it has an alert function or uh, alert method. So there are, no there are no method bodies in this class, so all of this, the actual implementations are provided by the browser. And, but there are types, and the types are what allows you to access those definitions in, in Kotlin in, types, in a type-safe way. So with full support for code completion, documentation, like type checking, and all of these nice features that statically typed languages give you. Yeah, and the window declaration is also like, it's how you get, so it's a top level property that gives you access to this instance of this window class. Now this is one possible way to interact with the JavaScript world. Uh, so in many cases you do want to have this, but in other cases this does not exactly work. For example, you may have a JSON API that's exposed by some, by some server. And you can of course also write external declarations specifying how to, specify what this, uh, what what is re what's the return value of this API and how it's structured and so on. But this may be a little bit cumbersome. So what you can do instead is you can rely on the dynamic type that is supported by the Kotlin.js compiler. So as soon as you declare a variable of type dynamic, this basically turns off Kotlin's type checker. So once you, once you have such a variable, you can do anything with it. You can access any properties, you can access any methods. They will also return values of type dynamic, so it, like you can chain such accesses, and Kotlin will just translate this directly into JavaScript as is. So the generated code will just have also the same code response, dot messages, square bracket zero, dot text. If this works, you are lucky. If this doesn't work well, the compiler is not to blame. It did not verify anything. Just make sure you get everything right. So like you get, do not get any compile time safety guarantees. So when we talk about uh, developing modern web applications uh, in Kotlin, you of course want to use modern frameworks as well. And probably the most well-known, one of the most used frameworks now is React. And in order to enable you to build React applications using Kotlin, we have built a set of official bindings for Kotlin. So basically it's some kind of something what the TS2KT tool would, could generate for you, but it's like more, more polished, more maintained, uh, and just in general works better. And you can use that <clears throat> you can use that to build React applications using Kotlin.js. And to make it easier to get started with, we have also built a CLI tool that generates uh, such an application for you. So you can install it through NPM and then essentially just run this one command to generate the application. And uh, it sets everything up, it sets uh, the necessary dependencies, it creates an IntelliJ project that you can open in the IDE right away. It sets up debugging via source maps. Uh, it sets up hot reloading, so basically all the goodness that you need to be productive when working with such an application. And also, uh, <coughs> we have also built a plugin for Gradle uh, that, lets, uh, that uh, provides the integration of, that essentially provides a bridge between the Kotlin world and the JavaScript world. So uh, you can still use Gradle for building uh, your Kotlin project, and, and uh, actually this is the build system that you have to use if you build multi-platform projects using Kotlin. And the Kotlin front-end plugin builds a bridge between that and the JavaScript ecosystem, meaning that you, have you can have dependencies on NPM libraries. It will automatically download Node and NPM for you so that you ju just don't need to pollute your computer with this JavaScript ugliness if you don't like this, like as I don't. <laughs> It will just do all of this stuff. It will run Webpack for you. It will let you run tests using Karma, which is a JavaScript uh, test framework. And it also supports hot reloading of changes. So you just, as soon as you uh, make some changes in the editor, it will just automatically recompile and reload the, the browser window. So that's a brief look at what we can do for JavaScript. But actually, just targeting JavaScript is not the interesting part of Kotlin. So what I have told so far, it's comparable to what other languages like TypeScript can deliver you, but it's not significantly better. So if you just want to develop purely a purely browser-based application, then Kotlin is a nice choice, but it's not like the full strength of what it can offer. The full strength comes with the ability of sharing code between your front end and your back end. So essentially when you share code, 
you get a project that has modules of multiple types. So you have the com uh, of essentially two different types. So you have a common modules, which contain code that is not specific to any platform. That would be the shared business logic of your application. And you have platform modules, which run on a specific platform. So either on the JVM or JavaScript or potentially native. So native is not supported yet by this system, but it will be supported in the near future. So a very important point here is that we do not want to have this write once anywhere, uh, write, run anywhere deal. So you run your code, uh, so uh, you do not write your code just in the common part. You have full X, you run uh, only the shared business logic as common code, and for the platform specific parts, you use the full benefits, full advantages of each platform by writing, a com uh, by writing dedicated implementations using the native platform APIs. So we are not going to provide you with a big facade that abstracts away all of the differences of this pla these platforms, because this would also like destroy all the unique advantages of each platform. Instead, we provide you a tool that allows you to easily write platform-specific implementations and access them from the common code. And I will tell you how exactly this works. So. What, how does the compilation process work for such a mixed project? So we have some common code, and we have JVM-specific code, and we have JavaScript-specific code. Now, what do we do when we try to compile the common code? The answer is we, we cannot really compile it by itself, because it, there's no like, real destination to it. We cannot it compile it to Java classes, because the JavaScript platform does not know anything about Java classes. Uh, we cannot compile it to JS, because we, we can, cannot do anything with JS on the JVM. So in order to compile such a module, you, take it, you need to combine it with a specific platform implementation. So if you take the common code together with the JVM code, you can compile the resulting combination to a bunch of class files on the JVM. If you take common code with the JavaScript specific part, you can compile them to a bunch of JavaScript files. And then like those combinations, you can run them on each platform as you need. Now, can you actually refer to platform-specific declarations from common code, and how can you do that? The answer is, of course, you can. And the way you do that is that uh, the common code can specify that it expects certain declarations to be provided by, the given, by each platform which is supported by this module. So in this case, I'm saying that uh, in my common code, I expect that there must be a date class provided by the platform. And those are the members that I expect it to have. So in this case, I'm, having, I'm expecting to have this get full year method. And there's probably a bunch of other methods to get access other components of the date. And on each specific platform, I provide an actual implementation. So in this case, this, so this is the JVM implementation. And in this JVM implementation, I have uh, built an implementation of this class based on the calendar class, which is part of the Java JDK. And this is a JavaScript implementation. And this is completely different because on, the Java on, on uh, JavaScript, there is a date class provided by the browser runtime. And I can actually refer to it as my implementation. So I can say that the actual uh, date class on JavaScript platform is external. Is it is provided by the platform. And I also specify that, yes, and by the way, it has all those methods that are expected to be there. And the way the compiler matches expected and actual declarations is essentially by qualified names. So the expected and actual declarations have to have the same, the same package, or in other words, the same qualified name. So the uh, common code expects a class from with the qualified name of kotlin.date.date to be there, and the, uh, the platform module provides this class, provides an actual implementation for it. And of course, you can also write common code that refers to these expected classes, so this is just a simple function from a common module that just accesses this date class and does some logic on it to check if two dates are on the same date. Now, so this ex expectant actual stuff, it looks kind of like interfaces, but not exactly. So why did we come up with our own thing for this, and why did not we just use interfaces? The answer to that is this mechanism of expected and actual declarations are, is, actual, is uh, much more flexible. So interfaces are essentially restricted to class members. So you need to somehow obtain the instance of a class. In order to do that, you need to have a factory. In order to obtain the instance of the factory, you need dependency injection. And this gets complicated fairly quickly. 
With our mechanism, there is no such restriction. So you can basically say that you ex expect a class and you also expect a cons this class to have a constructor. And once you do that, you can simply create a new instance of a date from common code without bothering with any factories, any dependency injection. Just go ahead and create like new open instance. And also you can uh, expect top level functions or extension functions to be there. So in Kotlin, we, we are not really keen on packaging everything into classes. We use top level functions a lot. And we also use extension functions a lot, which allow you to define your own methods on, on classes that are defined somewhere else. And so this multi-platform project mechanism, it integrates very nicely with, the, with all those features. So an expect declaration can be anything. It can be a class. It can be an interface, actually, which is not very useful, but you can do that for some reason. It can be a top-level function, or it can be an extension function. And one other advantage that this gives us is that it gives us the ability to reuse existing Java implementations very easily. So for example, like look at this testing annotation. So we expect, so there is this annotation class test. We expect it to be provided by the platform. And on the JVM, we happen to have an annotation that has exactly the same name, exactly the same semantics, but it just lives in a different package. So we can simply say that uh, the actual implementation of the test name, test of the test annotation on the JVM is org.juni.test annotation. So you don't have to re-implement anything, you don't have to repeat anything, you just say, okay, so the actual implementation of this expected type is this actual, uh, actual class. And this will also not work for interfaces because there is no way we can make an existing class uh, provided if coming from a third party library implement some interface that we have defined. This is simply not supported. So like once, this is one more way in which the expect actual mechanism is more powerful than interfaces. So how do we build this thing? So as I mentioned, this, support, this is only supported using Gradle and we have special plugins that you need to hook into a common module and uh, into platform-specific modules. And also, you, in a common module, you can, depend on, you can depend on common libraries, because it would be just not very useful if you had to write all this code from scratch and, or just provide expected definitions for all the APIs that you wanted to use. So of course, there are common libraries, and we support them. And like this is, for example, how you uh, specify a dependency on the Kotlin standard library, on the common version of the Kotlin standard library. On the platform, for a platform module, you do a very similar thing. So there is a separate plugin for compiling a platform-specific part. And you, of course, can specify like any, any dependencies like on the Java libraries or on uh, common, or you can specify dependencies on the Java libraries. And we also have this special expected by dependency. And this is how the link between a common module and a platform-specific part is created. So for every common module, like all the platform modules that implement the, that provide actual implementation for these expected APIs, have to have this expected by dependency in the build.gradle. But how do we actually compile the common library? So I mentioned that like when you compile a common an application, you cannot just build a common code by itself because there is like no code, no way to represent the code for it. But for a library, we do want to have some kind of common representation. So what do we do? The answer is that, is that when we compile a common module which is a part of a library, we, we produce these metadata files, which essentially is a serialized format of the declarations available in the library. So it does not contain any implementation code in any format. It just specifies basically the signatures of everything that is available in the library. And then when you compile the same library for a specific platform, we produce uh, specific implementations in the normal formats, like this would be a jar file for, for Java. For JavaScript, we, all, we currently also produce jar files which contain JavaScript files, JavaScript source code, and additional metadata that allows the Kotlin compiler to make sense of them. So basically, yeah, uh, each time you build a common library, it produces uh, multiple artifacts. So there is one common artifact that you reference from a common module, and there are platform-specific artifacts that you reference from each platform. So what libraries are there actually, other than the standard library? And what, function, what features can you rely on in your multi-platform code? So, yeah, sorry, I'll make a quick break. Oops. Oops. So the first thing is, of course, the Kotlin standard library. So what does it contain? It contains like the most basic facilities that you need in every 
in every project. So it has strings, it has collections, it has like utility high order functions like with and apply. It supports, it has a hierarchy of exceptions which may basically mirrors the hierarchy of exceptions defined in a JDK. It essentially gives you the essential tools without which you cannot really build much in Kotlin at all. But is that all? No, if, there's of course many other libraries which are available as common ones. So uh, you may have already guessed that uh, for, for the common code, we also provide the ability to run tests. And this is provided by the special Kotlin.test library. And it looks almost exactly like JUnit, because as, you have, as I have shown you, the actual implementation of all these annotations is provided by JUnit when you run on a GVM. And on JavaScript and on, and on native, we have custom implementations, of course. And essentially, there is nothing fancy here. There are annotations, there are assertion methods, and so you can just basically write tests for your common code, and you can run those tests under the JVM to make sure that your code runs correctly on the JVM, and you can run them under JavaScript to make sure that your code runs correctly in JavaScript. I will show you later in the demo how this looks in practice. Uh, one other library that is available in, in, as a common library is Kotlin x.html. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to build HTML pages using a Kotlin DSL. So instead of writing uh, just tags and attributes and content directly using the HTML syntax, you can use uh, Kotlin's strongly typed methods to do that. And of course, one of the benefits of this is that you can, you get better code completion, maybe you can get, uh, you get compile time checking to make sure that you get your like tag names correctly, but in fact, this is not that significant. The main reason why this is a good thing is something else. The good reason is that you can very easily refactor this code and you can very easily create abstractions. So you do not need to come up with fancy mechanisms in your templating language to do conditions and loops and includes and macros and substitutions and all of that. Because Kotlin already provides all these features. It has loops, it has conditions, it has classes that you can inherit from, it has functions that you can call with default parameter values. And in this case, so between these two slides, I have just extracted a bunch of functionality in the method. This is a very natural thing to do. It can be done like very easily. And by doing that, you can very easily compose parts of templates in a very maintainable way, which, which is somewhat better than you can do with like regular templates. And because this is a common library, uh, you can use this both on the client as, and on the server. So you can, if, in effect, you can do isomorphic rendering. So you can render the same UI of your application both on the server and on the client. And the demo project I will get to in a few minutes will show exactly how this works in a, like in a running application. But before I get to that, I want to mention one more library, which is called an exot serialization. So if you have shared code, if you have shared, like, data model classes which you want to use both on the client and on the server, then of course you want to pass instances of the classes between the client and the server so that you can uh, just expose the REST API that encodes those classes in JSON and access this REST API from your browser so that it can do, take those classes and do something with them on the browser. And the Kotlin, Kotlin X serialization library provides you exactly that. And it's actually very simple to use. So in the most basic cases, it's as simple as putting the add serializable annotation on all the classes that you want to pass in, in between the server and the client. And the library takes care of all the rest. The library is actually implemented, the library includes a plugin to the Kotlin compiler. So it does not rely on reflection in order to understand like what, what fields are in each class and how you actually serialize them. And in, so this provides much better performance and this actually lets uh, the library run on uh, the JavaScript where we don't currently have full support for reflection. And as for data formats, it supports JSON, it supports protobuf if you want something binary and it supports something else and you can also extend it of course to support your own data serialization formats. And uh, Building a larger array of common libraries is one of our, the main focus areas of the Kotlin team right now. So we want to have some cross-platform ways to do I.O. We want to cross -platform, want you to uh, write HTTP clients in a cross-platform way. Uh, and also like socket networking, like web sockets on the browser, regular sockets on the client. We want to have, we want to have a real common library for dates and not this like hack together stuff that I'm showing in my demo. 
And of course, much more, and we also expect the community to build many other common libraries for the tasks that are important to them. So with that, let's proceed to a demo. So first of all, let me run the application. It will not be very fancy, but what it does is actually, like how it does the thing that it does is actually much more interesting than what exactly it does. So I'm running this application. It runs, started up some kind of a server. And you see that, so basically it just renders some random messages. So there is not much value in the specific content shown there. But the interesting part is what we see if, if you press view source. So basically, you see here that this has just five messages. So the first five messages you see on the page were rendered by the server when it sent the page. And the rest of the messages were rendered on the client by JavaScript code. And now let's look at the implementation of this. So I will switch to my IntelliJ back. And we'll look at the project. So you will see that this project contains a bunch of modules. So there is this uh, common module called shared. Which has, the plat uh, which has also platform-specific parts, uh, uh, the JS and the JVM-specific part. And there are also separate modules that contain the back-end-specific and the front-end-specific code. So if you look at the build.gradle for the common module, the, you see that it has uh, dependencies on, uh, it has this uh, common Gradle plugin. And it also references a bunch of common libraries, which are basically the ones that I have was just mentioned. So the standard library, the Kotlin XHTML, serialization, and Kotlin.test. And if you look at the build.gradle for a platform module, then it also has like the stuff that you expect, this Gradle plugin applied, a bunch of dependencies on the Java JVM specific libraries, including JUnit, which of course is, is a Java library. And this expected by dependencies that links it to the shared project. So what code do we actually have in this project? So first of all, the, uh, I, we have here this very date class that I was showing in my slides. So this, is ex so this is expected to be provided by the platform. It is expected to have a constructor. It is expected to have a bunch of methods. And there are also a bunch of expected top level functions like parsing and converting dates to strings. And uh, it has two actual implementations, one for the JVM and one for JavaScript. And this is basically all the stuff that I have sh that I showed you on the slides. So the actual implementation for the JVM is provided is implemented using java.util.calendar and java.text.simple date format. And the one for JavaScript is implemented on top of the date class provided by the browser. So the next thing that I'm going to show is this message class. So this is essentially the data model of our system. So this is a very trivial example. So the data model is as simple as it can be. So it just has a text, the author, and date. And once again, this is common code. And also in the common code, I have the function that I'm using to serialize and deserialize date instances, the message instances. So I have this to JSON and from JSON methods. And they use the JSON class from the Kotlin.x.serialization library in order to essentially to convert instances to strings and to parse them from strings. And I'm also re registering custom serializer for the date class because the serialization framework does not do anything, does not know anything about dates. So I'm just specifying myself how I want them to be represented in JSON. And the last file that I want to show here is this one. This is how we actually render messages to HTML. So this uses the cottonx.html library and I'm using this DSL, so it's very simple. I'm, re I'm creating a div, I'm putting up appending the text of the message, so this plus, this funny plus character essentially means append to the output. It's like an overloaded unary plus operator. And I'm creating an italic tag that contains also some other content. By the way, here I'm refer referencing, uh, once again I'm referencing a common function that has multiple expected implementations. And if I look, do find usages on that, I will see that this function is used bo both by the server and by the client. So on the server, when I, just, when I just render the initial page, I just generate five random messages and render them as part of the HTML page. And on the client, I'm invoking the REST API to get some more messages. I deserialize the response. 
and I append them to the DOM. So this is, once again, this is isomorphic rendering. So I'm using exactly the same code on the server and on the client. And if I had a larger application, I could render the entire UI of my application, both on the server on, and on the client, using exactly the same code. So, a uh, couple other things that I wanted to show. So, of course, the IDE provides a bunch of assistance for dealing with this expect actual stuff. So, for example, if I create an expect function, the IDE highlights that it does not, I have not provided any actual implementations and it helpfully <laughs> suggests me to create some. So, on the JVM, I will do system.out just to make sure that I'm on the GVM because you can just do println directly on Kotlin and this works on any platform. And on the JavaScript, I'm going to do console.log. And of course, refactorings take care of this as well, so I can rename this to, I can rename this, this will update the actual implementations. I can add a parameter to it using the change signature refactoring. And the actual implementations will have been updated too. So now they both have the string parameter. Yeah, and one other thing that I wanted to show is running tests for the common code. So in, here in this shared module, once again, this is common code, I have this date test class. And you have seen it on the slides, basically. So this is using the scotland.test framework. And if I right-click this, if I select the run option in the ID, I will get actually two possibilities how I can run this. I can either run this as a Mocha test or I can run it as a JUnit test. So let's try Mocha first. So as you can see, now it has started Node for me and started this Mocha JavaScript test framework and did a bunch of javascript -y stuff. And in the result, I get a successful test. Now let me delete this run configuration. I unfortunately have to do this for the time being because of issues. <laughs> and now I'm going to run this again. But run this again, run this again. Uh, and it runs on the JUnit, the same test. So pretty cool, right? Okay. So that's multi-platform projects, basically. So that's, the, that's what you can do to share your code and your business logic between uh, JavaScript and the JVM. And one other thing, that, and of course, if you looked at the picture that I, was shown pre that I showed previously with uh, JavaScript, JVM, and Android, this is, of course, not all the tiers of an application that you might want to build. There's one other one, which is called iOS. And the great news is that, like, very, as we announced very recently, so we, it, act, we actually made the initial announcement on Kotlin Conf two weeks ago in San Francisco. Kotlin Native now supports development for iOS as well. And so the way it works is that we have actually built an LLVM-based toolchain that takes Kotlin code and produces native binaries out of that. So, so in order to build the iOS app out of that, you still need to have Xcode installed, which takes care of all the packaging, signing, and all the funky stuff that you need to do to get your app to App Store. <laughs> but at least for the initial compilation process, uh, we are using basically the same tool chain that Apple does. So we produce a fully native, uh, fully normal iOS application. No GC, no JIT. No, no JVM inside it, so just basically a regular native application that is just as, looks exactly like a one that you can build with Swift. <coughs> and of course, in this application, you have all, all access to the libraries available on the platform. So you can access core libraries written in Objective-C, you can access just regular C libraries, you can access Kotlin libraries, so just everything that, uh, everything that you need is available for you. And the way this works is that we have built a special tool uh, that generates Kotlin metadata from C header files. Essentially, essentially what you do is you feed the header files for your library to this tool. It is based on the C lang front end, so it does the actual real C parsing, so no regular expressions, no like pattern, no just fuzzy pattern matching like the real stuff. 
It supports all C types, like you know, including the complicated ones, like callbacks to functions that you have to pass to a C function or structs, basically everything you need. It supports Objective-C types because that's what you need for Objective-C interop. And it spits out a metadata file with Kotlin, basically what Kotlin needs to be able to call these functions to know how to call these functions from Kotlin code. And using these two, we, we essentially generate uh, headers for all of the platform libraries. So for example, this is, this is what the dependencies of our demo app look like. So you see that all the regular iOS frameworks are there, it's like AppKit, Core Data, essentially everything. These are Objective-C frameworks, and you have full access to them from Kotlin code. And this is just a code example showing how such an access looks like. So this is a part of the code from our demo app that shows the game center in, uh, on, an, on an iPhone. So once again, you don't need to be able to understand exactly what's happening here. I don't understand it myself. But the key thing is that you have full access to the platform APIs written in Objective-C. So what about memory management? This is like one of the most common questions we get when talking about this stuff. So for, for this time, so I, the, the answer to this is like very preliminary. So this is still like version 0 0.4, and a lot of things are going to change before the final release, and one of them is the memory management. So for now, we have reference counting plus uh, cycle collector. Uh, the reference counting works rather efficiently because we don't support uh, memory shared between threads. So you, we can, we don't need to bother about atomically updating the reference counters. It's just as, like there's no memory contention involved when we do that. But once again, maybe we will end up with a tracing GC. Maybe we will end up with something different. Maybe we will end up with different solutions on different platforms. This is all still being designed. And of course, Kotlin Native is not just about iOS. So we support, so we support just as well Linux and uh, Windows and Mac. And if you have been to Ben uh, and uh, the, the other guys, for, sorry, I forgot the name, talk. Uh, Andreas hmm? was yeah, and Andreas, yeah, Ben and Andreas' talk earlier today uh, about WebAssembly, we have just announced that the Kotlin can be compiled to WebAssembly as well. And in the future, we are going to explore embedded platforms uh, and to provide a complete tool chain for developing embedded applications using Kotlin, Kotlin Native. We already support like some paths required for it, so we support like Linux running on MIPS, for example, but there is much more, more work to do before we get to a complete solution. As for the tooling, uh, for Kotlin Native, we have recently announced a plugin for CLion, which is our ID for C and C++. It, it is essentially a customized version of the regular Kotlin plugin, so it supports all the features like refactorings, code inspections, all of that is there. And it supports like platform-specific debugger and a platform-specific test runner. And I do not have time for a complete demo, but I, so I will just show you a couple of screenshots. So this is native code under a debugger. You see the call stack, you see the variables, you, you can see even the variable values directly in the debugger, like in a regular IntelliJ. And under the hood, this is powered by LLDB, so you can also use LLDB command line if you like that. This works also for common Kotlin native code. <coughs> And this is just a test runner result, so showing the result of running some native tests using the same Kotlin.test framework as I was showing previously. So that's what I wanted to talk about it uh, about today. So to summarize, our goal is to allow you to all write all parts of your application in the same language. Android, iOS, backend, frontend, if any other platform comes up, we will support that as well. But basically anything we want to be, we want Kotlin to really be available anywhere. And with full access to the, all the best that each platform has to offer. So platform specific APIs, platform specific like application structure features, we, you will have full access to it. And this means that we do not, do not want to abstract away the, the differences between every platform. You will still have access to the full API of each platform when you run this. And the, uh, and the shared code will only be the business logic of your application, which does not inherently depend on the platform. And we have already released a solution for using the code for between the JVM and JavaScript, and native will plug into the same system soon. So this is all being very actively worked on, so I'm just talking about the state of things as they are today. So if you want to learn more about Kotlin, the official website is kotlin.lang.org. There's a blog where we publish a lot of our announcements and 
talk about the new cool stuff that we are building. We have a Slack with a very friendly community, so you can go and ask questions there, and people from the team will, are there to answer you. And there's also a book written by me and my colleague uh, that basically gives you an introduction into Kotlin, the Kotlin language. It does not talk about any of this stuff because this was all developed after the book came out. But just as a, just a, way, as a way to get started with Kotlin, it's just an excellent way to get to know the basics. So thank you, and let's get to proceed to questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes and we've got a lot of questions, okay. so um, let's start with a very simple one. What does Kotlin stand for? Uh, Kotlin is an island near St. Petersburg where the Kronstadt city is located. And so we just saw many languages named after islands like Java and Ceylon and we decided that, we decided that okay, we have an, an island of our own, so why don't we name the language after it? And the name so stuck. So Kotlin yeah. is an island. Yep. Um, can you use dynamic types in the common code? No, you cannot use dynamic types in the common code. This is just a JavaScript feature. Like it's theoretically possible to support it, but we just don't have enough use cases for that. Mm -hmm. uh, could uh, Kotlin JS be used to write server-side JavaScript code uh, that runs on Node.js? Uh, yes, you can use uh, Kotlin JS to, run, to write code that runs on the Node.js, but if you're writing in Kotlin anyway, that, then you might as well use a proper runtime, which is the JVM. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, does it support Maven instead of Gradle? I think you mentioned it, but I'm not sure. Uh, so Kotlin as a whole supports Maven uh, definitely. Specifically, the multi-platform projects are on only Gradle for now, but uh, we will support Maven later as well. So there is no, no big difficulty, just something that we haven't done yet. Okay, then a bit longer question. Uh, your hello go to bear example gives different behavior between JVM and JS, uh, different print outputs. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do we ensure uh, that implementations of a common library stand, uh, stay identical? Uh, do we write extension tests for that? Yeah, if Extensive you, intro. So if you want the behavior to be identical, then yes, you write tests. In many cases, you actually do not want the behavior to be identical. You want it to be the appropriate to the platform that you are running on. But yeah, the common test facility exists exactly so that you can do exactly that to write tests verifying the compliance of the two to different implementations. Okay. Then something about the uh, iOS stuff. Um, well, first of all, a question that I had in mind, uh, you're only talking about um, Objective-C, what about Swift libraries? Uh, we, at this time, we do not yet support Swift interop. We are working on that. It will be supported in the future, but it's not there at this moment. And then the question here was, uh, would it be possible to write a library in Kotlin that could be used from Swift? Uh, yes, it's also something that we are working on right now. Okay, and the same, uh, more or less the same question, whether there are any plans for C++ library compatibility with Kotlin native? <sighs> I, uh, so as far as I understand, there are some ABI differences, so you cannot directly call a Kotlin library from C++, but I think that this, it is something that can be straightened out later, so there is no principal, dif principal reason why this is not, impo uh, not possible, this is something simply not done yet. So this is just very, once again, this is all very much preview and actively developed. Yeah, uh, which would lead to the next question. It's a very strong story already. Uh, but when would you expect the first uh, real applications uh, that are developed in a cross uh, way, like you showed it, uh, to yeah, start to begin or to, to develop? Uh, this is a really good question. I would expect, like, I don't know, early next year maybe. There is st still quite a few missing pieces, so this is a very rough experience. As, as like, uh, If you get into the iOS land, I did not show any demos because it's, it's just difficult to find the narrow path where everything is working. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, so, but once again, this will improve very rapidly. Okay. The other questions, I think, have been answered during the talk. Any questions from the audience right now? Just raise your hand. I come to you. Yeah, Over there. One there. Uh, any dependence on on the Kotlin version? 
Is it Kotlin 1.2 based or? So the multi-platform stuff is available in Kotlin 1.2. The native stuff kind of lives on itself, so it has Kotlin native has its own release cycle. It's not yet plugged into the main. It's like kind of a separate project. But like Kotlin, Kotlin native 0.4 includes Kotlin 1.2, so you can have all the same features there, basically. Any other questions? I'll be around at the exhibitor reception, so you can just find me and chat with me. I can ask to just talk about anything Kotlin related or JetBrains related if you're just if you are curious about stuff that we are doing. Oh, uh, I would have one. Um, I just heard some that the Kotlin native stuff is supported in uh, C Lion. Yep. Uh, will it also be possible to use it in the Ultimate Edition? Maybe. So this we had a lot of internal discussions on that. There is no final decision okay. yet. Yeah, would be great. Yep. <laughs> okay, um, thanks a lot.